This is the moment you've all been waiting for. DC and RC. Welcome to a brand new episode of DC. Coming to you from Lafayette, Louisiana. It's DC and RC. Hailing from Aurora, Louisiana. It's fight night. Catch your right hook and your right eye. Change how you look. Daniel, come in here. And Ryan Clark, the champs are here. With battle scars, it's warfare. Louisiana's in the air. From Aurora to Lafayette to Los Angeles to Times Square. Well, I could go one show without you going, I'm Super Bowl champ. When the mic's on, it's showtime. DC and RC, we win in Super Bowls and Emmys. And Daniel got two belts around the belly. Oh, you the history! I'm DC, two division champ. I ran the UFC. Cause we asking all, all the tough questions. This guy's the worst, I see. I don't know how you can do a show with DC, you broke my heart. This is MMA, mixed martial all stars. And we bought that ground and pound, so be on guard. And we going round for round, cause we want it all. But there can only be one in the octagon. DC and RC, DC and RC, DC and RC, ESPN, tune in to see. What's up, guys? Welcome to a brand new episode of DC and RC. I'm Daniel Cormier. That's my man, Ryan Clark. RC, I got to be honest. Like, I know the words to the song now. I, I, the whole time I'm singing, <laughs> DC and RC, DC and RC. And RC. I, I'm out here rapping now, dog. I, I love it. What's going on, my brother? Hey, nothing. DC, uh, I was a little late today because we had some things to do. But this is how you show up and wait for the show to start, bro? What is that, DC? Is that like a, a a big roll of furry toilet paper that you had on you? What's going on? <laughs> RC, so this morning I went to play golf, and it was raining and it was cold. And like, hey, RC, I'm just a nice little tender, gentle giant, you know? So I got this little blanket <laughs> that I put over my body when I'm cold, you know? So I was, I was waiting for you, <laughs> taking my time. It was cold. Hey, RC, I played golf with two black golf pros from New Orleans. And you and I both know, nobody playing golf, especially brothers nobody. down in Louisiana. It was crazy. I could not believe it, bro. I could not believe it. Today hey, on the show, guys, what, we are going to... The thing is this, though. Sorry, oh, no, wait, DC. The, the, the thing is this, though. Like, golf has become such a huge sport, bro. No matter where I go, I'm always asked by businessmen, by other athletes, do you golf? And I don't. I got to find some time to learn, DC, so at least I can be where the business happens. And so it could be like hey. those two golf pros from New Orleans and then me and you from Lafayette in the West Bay. Yeah, hey, RC, listen, business happens on the golf course, but I'm going to teach you how to play golf because if you're going to be playing, you got to at least be as horrible as I am. Guys, coming <laughs> up on the show, we're going to recap UFC 296 and RC and I are going to hand out some awards. And as always, we tap in or we tap out. RC, last weekend, Leon Edwards and Kobe Covington finally fought. But yep. as the week went on, it got more and more nasty. Before yeah. we get into all the drama surrounding the fight, what did you make of Leon's performance? And what did you make of Kobe's performance? Because honestly, that was real unexpected. Yeah, I think... Leon's performance was expected for me. We know what sort of striker Leon is. We know how great of a counter striker Leon is. And he doesn't put himself in harm's way. And when you have the sort of streak that he has, that's kind of part of it. And normally what happens with these sorts of strikers is their opponent puts them in position where they have to fight, right? Where they have to mix it up. And I don't feel like Kobe Covington ever did that. All I heard before the fight from you, Joe Rogan, and John Anik was the fact that Kobe Covington was going to use his cardio. Kobe Covington was going to use his wrestling. None of those things actually took place inside the octagon. And what was even more strange about that to me from Leon's perspective was that he invited the grappling. He invited the wrestling mm. when that's not something we've seen from him. Maybe he felt like over the last two fights, with Kamaru, he'd shown improvement. But if we're really going to get to the the gist of what that fight was, let's call it what it was, DC. It was boring. Mm. 
uh, you know, it was boring because it played exactly to the way Leon Edwards prefers a fight to be. He is a guy that is so clean that if he can pick you apart, he's going to pick you apart. He's not, you don't win 11 fights in a row by taking just unnecessary risk. And when you're as talented as Leon Edwards is, and you have an ability to control people in the way that he can, why would you do that? Why do you put yourself, because dude, for a long time, RC, he could not avoid the bad. Because he would beat guys up, Nate Diaz, for, for that matter. He got hit one time, and yep. people talked about Nate Diaz more than Leon Edwards when he pitched the shutout. So he's in right. there, and he's doing his thing, and there's no reason for Rocky to take any unnecessary chances. I thought he fought a wonderful fight. I only thought that he could have pressed the gas down a little more to try to get yeah. the finish because it really did not feel like Kobe was going to give him anything that was going to really uh, put him in any danger. He, he wasn't DC, committing to any of you. his punches. Go ahead. My question for you is, you said he should have put his foot or he could have put his foot on the gas a little more. As a fighter, as a champion, how much do you feel a a champ is required to put his foot on the gas and attempt to get the knockout or attempt to get the finish? Or are you kind of saying that because of the bad blood between Kobe and Leon? Mm. There's two There's two different reasons. One, the bad blood. Those guys wanted to fight each other so bad that even at the weigh-ins, you got to separate them. And you got to really separate them because Leon and his team wants to kill Kobe. Also because it is. I'm a friend of Leon Edwards. I've trained with him. I've known him for a really long time. I know that he needs impressive performances to reach the level that he deserves to be at in terms of pay-per-view sales and everything else. He's one of those guys that, for as special as he is inside the octagon, for as good as he is inside the octagon, people still aren't drawn to him like they should be. Leon Edwards is a guy that's won now... Uh, unbeaten in 12 fights. He's the welterweight champion. He has done away now with the past decade or so of the welterweight division. The, the, the generation before him of great welterweights, he has now beaten. He beat Kamar Usman. He beat Nate Diaz. He beat Colby Covington. He beat everybody from that past generation of, of welterweights. And he still isn't held in as high regard as I feel he should be. And I think if he would have put Colby away he would have gotten more of the respect that I feel like he so rightfully deserves. But this guy, after all the bad luck, I could see why he would say, you know what, man, this was in the bag. I'm going to just kind of take it to the end and get my hand raised. And that's exactly what he did. You know, like, that's the that's the job, right? The, the job of the champion is to, once the fight is over, to hear and steal, right? So when you come into yep. the octagon or when you're making that walk, it's to leave the same way that you came. And when you're not getting pressed the way Kobe wasn't pressing Leon, when you're not getting put in danger by the activity of the contender, I don't really necessarily feel it's on you to fight any way that's not you. Now, if you're one of those dudes that continues to press forward, if you are a Daniel Cormier that is about pressure, if you're a Daniel Cormier that wants to get his hands on you, that wants to be tight and wants to fight, whether it's from the clinch or fight from, from the box, then that's what you're going to be every single fight. That's not who Leon Edwards is. He's a dude that understands mm -hmm. range. He's a guy that understands counter-striking, that fights with the level of defense. If you're that sort of fighter, you're going to do what it takes to win. And we've seen this sometimes with guys like Anderson Silva, with guys like... Um, you know, Israel Adesanya. And so I think it's going to be hard for Leon Edwards to be anything different. And what's crazy about what you said is we were having this conversation with Glenn. You know, he runs all of UFC here at ESPN, and he was talking about making stars and that it has to be a combination of a lot of things. I think one of those things is an exciting fighting style, right? And, and a style mm -hmm. that draws people to you, which isn't necessarily always counter-striking. But let's think a little bit about Israel Adesanya, right? Israel Adesanya had Kelvin Gastelum, right, which was a fight yep. we weren't expecting to be what it was. But we got to see him dig deep and have a war 
and win that fight. You know, we saw John Jones fight the legends, but one of those fights that really made John Jones what he was was us getting to see him against uh, Alexander Gustafson, right? And them be in that toe-to-toe -to -toe Hall of Fame fight. Leon Edwards fights Nate Diaz, which should be a kingmaker fight, but still for him, it doesn't resonate. Why do you feel it's so difficult right now for Leon, who is on a 12-fight win streak, to capture the audience and become a fan favorite? You know, I think people appreciate Leon Edwards. I think they do. The greatness. It's hard to not appreciate the greatness. I think that it's because he's been so in control of these fights. Because people acted like Nate Diaz almost won, but all he did was hit him one time and then pointed at him. He right. got Kamaru Usman with the late head kick, so everybody was like, well, he got lucky. He kicked him in the head. But then he doubled back and beat him again. But I think it's in these moments where you're fighting these guys and it's not resounding, where you go, oh, I just watched the best. He showed that there are, there's a river between them. And so then the people yeah. want to question it. But he, he, he should get more respect. And I believe that in time, he will. But my worry now is... He's done away with the names. He's done away with the names in the division. And right. unless people hold him in high regard right now, the Shavkat Rachmanovs, the Bilal Muhammad's, the those guys don't have the name value of Usman, Covington, Diaz to really elevate him. So when you fight these guys, you have to take something from them. Their shine needs to become your shine if you want to become that guy that is the pay-per-view draw. So I think that what Leon's going to have to do next is put the next person away. Put the next person away and do it in a fashion that there is no more questions, that you know you have to watch a Leon Edwards fight. You know what I, I love, though, RC, about Leon Edwards? Hey, dude is different, RC. Dude is different. When he hits that curtain, Cat starts to smile every yeah. time. I don't remember a time when I would hit that curtain where I would start smiling, like, yo, I'm in my element and somebody's about did. to get it. I start running because I didn't want to think yeah. about it. Leon Edwards is strolling, bro. He is strolling to the octagon, and that brother's, like, smiling. Like, I'm like, whoa, this dude is different, bro. He's very different. And I said it on his walk. I said, yo, Leon Edwards is not a dude to be played with. And I think yeah. that interaction with Kobe Covington, made him so mad because he felt so disrespected by George Masvidal that he said, I'm never doing that again. But RC, right. it was a call from George St. Pierre or a text from George St. Pierre that centered him to not allow for emotion to dictate the way that he fights and look at what he did to Covington in the fight on Saturday night. Yeah, you know, for, for you, DC, you said he had to put the next dude out. Let's talk about the next dude. It would seem that guys like Shavkat and guys like Bilal would be the next up, right? That they should get the opportunity to fight for the welterweight championship. But Leon said he didn't feel like Bilal should be next up. And we've heard a lot from these 170 pounders, especially now that Israel Adesanya is no longer the middleweight champion, about moving up and taking their shot at Sean Strickland. What do you think, two questions, answer them both. What do you think mm -hmm. should be next? For Leon Edwards, and what do you think will be next if those two things are different? You know what's crazy, man? I like Bilal Muhammad a lot. I really like Bilal Muhammad. I think, without a shadow of a doubt, that Bilal Muhammad should be fighting for the belt next. He got to weigh in this weekend as the alternate fighter. He has not lost in a really long time. Him and, him and Leon had a fight that got stopped because of an eye poke. And, bro, Ryan, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but watch the footage of Leon on the bus after that. He was crying, dog, because he poked him in the eye, and he was like, I didn't want to do that. This was my chance to finally beat somebody and get a title fight. He, every, right. So much bad was going wrong for Rocky. I feel the same way about Bilal now, bro. Leon saying that Saturday, and then Dana saying, I'm not ready to commit to this, should be so worrisome for him. He should have been watching that post-fight presser and hoping that the next thing that Dana will said when asked who's next, he'd say, well, it's Bilal Muhammad. He wouldn't commit to that. Right. That, to me, is scary. 
That to me is very scary if your team, Bilal Muhammad. So I think Bilal should be next. But I have no idea if he will be next. And that's very unfortunate because he has earned a chance to fight for the welterweight championship of the world. It seems to me like Leon Edwards wants the 185-pound champion to be next. And I can't say that um, that's not going to be the case because now you got Drake's Duplessis and Sean Strickland fighting in line with Leon Edwards to where after the fight in January, after Leon just fought this month, they're all back in line to like be matched up um, in the second quarter of the year. You know, it's it's really gotten wild to me, the sort of super fight double champion setups. Like, this was a rare thing when you just think about a few years ago. You know, that's why it was amazing yep. to see you accomplish this feat. It was amazing to see Conor McGregor accomplish this feat. It's why, you know, guys like Henry Cejudo are thought of in such high regard because you just weren't getting these opportunities. And now all of a sudden, Leon Edwards is saying, I want Sean Strickland. <laughs> and it seems that if it's something that is being talked about, Islam Mahachev also weighed in mm -hmm. on whether or not or Leon Edwards should have him up next. He said, Leon Edwards has to be next. Edwards Covington was bull you know what, man. You have to change the champion. And so it sounds like Islam's basically saying a little bit of what you're saying, DC, in this. Shavkat is not a superstar, an extremely good fighter, an undefeated fighter that dispensed with Wonderboy Thompson in a way we've never seen him dispense before. But he's not a name that is ringing amongst the fans. Same thing with Bilal Muhammad. Now, if you're talking about Leon Edwards, you want to make a name? You want to show people that you're the real deal? You want to gain fans? That's the dude to fight. The problem is it's a terrible matchup for Leon Edwards. When you hear Islam saying it's time for a change at 170, should this be something that Dana and the matchmakers actually look into? I think, I think Islam should defend his championship in his weight class. I mean, there is a queue of guys lined up because now you got Gaethje, you got Oliveira, you got um, Armand Sarukian. You got so many real quality challengers at that weight class that I believe that his next business should be at 155. And this is me talking as a friend of Islam Mahachev. But I do believe that the next double champ attempt will come between... 55 champ to 70, and 70 champ to 85. And I'll tell you why. Because when a guy like Islam looks at Leon Edwards, he thinks to himself, I can implement my game plan well enough to where I can beat this dude and become the double champ. And the reason Leon Edwards is saying that is because he goes, well, Sean Strickland is a striker. I feel like my style is good enough to compete with him. Dude, everybody wasn't doing that when Izzy was the champion. They did, They were unsure. They weren't doing that when Pereira was the champion. They were unsure. They weren't doing Heck that yeah. when Usman was the champion. So when they look at these champs, they feel like there are some opportunities for them mm -hmm. to get in there and beat them. So they're all kind of nipping at the bud. Um, interesting times. I do believe that in 2024, we will see someone make an attempt. There will be a champ versus champ fight. I just don't know what combination of those two weight classes is going to be at, but it's a very fun time. You know, we're kind of moving DC, forward. I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, DC, just my real quick question. I know we got to get to Patty and Tony. When you look at the fact that there will be more attempts at double champions or champ to champ fights, is that an indication of, or how much is that an indication of the champions not being the great names or how much of it is an indication of the challengers not being the great names? You know, I, I think it's more about the champions just chasing. Conor McGregor made it possible, right? We were all scared before. Right. Like, you just wanted to be the UFC champion. They teased for so long Anderson versus John, and no one ever did it because Anderson's like, I'm not sure. Now it's a reality, so everyone wants to do it. But I feel like because it's happening so often or there are so many attempts at it to the general fan like you and 
it's kind of like a little bit of a put off. So I, I, I hope it slows down a little bit and people become the dominant champs that GSP and Anderson and Jones and those guys were before them. I know we're going to talk about Patty Pimler, but I really wished we had an opportunity to talk a little Colby Covington before we went forward because I wanted to know from you, RC, because I when I you saw that you saw that video of me walking into Leon Edwards' locker room the other yeah. day. One of the conversations that Rock and I had were about the moment and how it got too big for Colby Covington. And he said, 100% I felt like once he said that, he didn't realize the reaction he would garner because it went from them getting ready to fight to Rock's entire team wanting to kill Colby Covington, bro. They, could, he want, right. they wanted to get him everywhere. My ask to you is, when you watch that, one, do you feel like the moment it became a real thing to Colby Covington? Like, oh my God, it's a real fight. Was it too big? And secondly, does it put you off when a Colby Covington says what he said about Leon's dad? And then that the way in says, I was in character. Or Conor McGregor says yeah. the things that he said about Khabib's dad. And then in the octagon, he says, it was just business. How much of a put off is that to a guy like you that's watching? From the outside, it's it's a it's, it's a large put off to me for for this reason. Stand on business, say what you say, man, and mean it, right? And when you look at Kobe Covington, I understand that he's in character and that he's trying to build a fight, a la a guy like Chell Sonnen. But Kobe Covington has now built himself up to where he has a certain following. You heard Sean Strickland speak directly to that following by name, by, by, by character, and saying, you guys are my people, and I know you rock with Kobe too, but what he did is unacceptable, right? And to even say, Leon Edwards' mom, who was a widow, right, had to raise Leon and raise the man. And then for Kobe Covington to then say, I was in character. Here is, I know, a statement that as a non- fighter people may not respect from me it's some people who bought that life and some people who ain't mm -hmm. it's some people yep. who will stand on business whether in the octagon outside of the octagon no matter where it is and if we gotta throw hands we gotta throw hands jorge masvidal right nate diaz you're never going to hear those guys apologize for anything they say or anything they do because with them it's on site wherever it is Kobe Covington is a prize fighter. Kobe Covington is a guy that learned to wrestle, is a guy that has learned mixed martial arts, and he wants to apply his trade within the octagon. He's created this character because although he was a good fighter, nobody cared. And that character has got him to this position where he has a following. What he realized is sometimes you can say things where you F around and find out. And what happened was, yeah. looking at Leon, looking at Leon's team, he effed around and found out. And it wasn't that the championship moment was too big for him. It was that this has now turned from what I thought was fighting for a championship to us fighting because we have real beef. And it doesn't seem that Kobe yep. truly ever wants to have real beef. Yeah, it was like when, like they used to say, when keeping it real goes wrong. Because Kobe kind yeah. of paused before he said it. He paused before he said it. So it was like, am I really going to say this? And uh, he did, unfortunately. And, and he didn't show up on Saturday night to back up the words. But yeah, I had a great conversation with the champion. Two other guys that fought Saturday was Patty Pimblett and Tony Ferguson. Ryan, Tony Ferguson would seem to be done. Like, call it, a, I mean, call it what it is. But... Paddy Pimblett, while he won the fight, how impressed were you with Paddy Pimblett? Obviously, we, we know the story is going to be about Tony. I mean, between 2011 and 19, dude was 15 and 1 with 11 finishes from 20 to 20 to 23. This dude is 0 and 7, no finishes, one bonus, and a minus 192 strike differential. Is it time for him to hang it up, RC? And it is. How sad are you to see him go? I'm, I'm not sad. And here's why I'm not sad, DC. As, as someone who is retired, much like yourself, 
it's actually good to know you ain't got it no more. You know what I mean? It's actually good to not have the itch. And I think the reason Tony continues to fight is because he has the itch and maybe still believes that he has it. And I think he's starting to learn that he doesn't. Um, so I'm not sad to see Tony go because I think Tony gave us all he had. I think Tony gave this, the, the, these fights, I think he gave this game everything that was in his body, and he has nothing to be ashamed of. And so I think on the other side, you heard Dana say, I, I don't want to speak on retiring a guy, but I hope he does. On the other side, it's not like I watched Patty Pimblett and I saw future Hall of Famer either. It's not like I watched Patty Pimblett and I thought to myself, this guy is a future champion. So when you look at what's next for both of these men, DC, what do you think should and will happen? I believe that Tony Ferguson should retire. And I really try to limit, I really try to limit trying to show a man the door. Because nobody knows when someone's done until they know that they're done. You know, you and I spoke about this in year one of the show where we spoke of how difficult it became for you to even walk down the stairs at your house and you knew, man, I, I, I can barely get to Sundays. And I knew uh, the same thing. Only Tony knows when it's time. But it seems as though he's the only one left that isn't sure. Everybody else feels pretty certain that that time has come for Tony Ferguson. Patty Pimblett fought really well in the first round. Yep. And he did a good job with his grappling. But I just... I don't know, man. He told us that he had made all these improvements in his striking and he was going to keep his chin down as he approached the striking. It, it, it just looked the same. And it was a decision victory against Tony Ferguson, who lately has not been able to get to the final bell inside of his fights. Granted, he was fighting Michael Chandler and, and yeah. Justin fight, Gaethje fight and Nate Diaz. Yeah. He's fighting killers, right? But I just did not... I don't know, man. I don't think Patty fought bad, but I think that he DC. needed to do a little more. That's why it pisses me off so much when people compare everybody to Conor McGregor. When Conor McGregor was on his way up, he was finishing dudes. Stop. He was knocking everybody. dudes clean. He was everybody. doing his thing. He was doing his thing. It was never close. You know what, DC? It's Has anybody ever had a wet blanket put on top of their fire faster than Patty <laughs> Pimblett? When 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 Patty Pimblett yes yes yes, yes. wait started wait, in wait yes yes Ian Gary bro Ian Gary bro they've been dragging <laughs> Ian Gary through the mud bro they've been dragging poor Ian Gary bro behind his wife hey, and all this other stuff hey. they've been dragging Ian Gary bro they've been killing Ian over personal stuff though <laughs> you know what I mean at least when <laughs> Ian steps in the octagon we see something that makes us go okay we want to see this kid again or we want to see him <laughs> against better competition. Like, he need to, like, delete his Instagram and social media, though, and keep <laughs> his books off the books. But when I watch <laughs> Patty Pimblett, D.C., it's like, I don't want to see him fight again. And I'm not saying like, I, I want Patty Pimblett to retire. What I'm saying is when he's on the card now, I'm not excited to watch him do his mm. job. I'm more so mm. watching to see if his chin continues to stay high if his defense continues to stay open, who's going to tap that chin? And so I think he's now in a position that's going to be very hard because it was like that meatball Molly, Patty Pimblett craze that was sweeping the UFC is now dead as a doorknob. And so for mm. him, figuring out what's next is very important because he has to find a way to tap into what he had when he started fighting in the UFC. But for sure, this was nowhere near a bonus fight for either of these guys, and it dang sure wasn't fight of the year. Speaking of, DC, I do want to know yep, what yep, your yep. fight of the year are, fight, fight of the year is, so let's give out some awards. Yep. I like that. I love this. All right, guys, so for fight of the year, RC and I go back to UFC 283, Jamal Hill versus Glover Teixeira in Brazil. UFC 284, RC, Makachev versus Volkanovski 1, or 
UFC Ooh. 290. Brandon Moreno versus Alessandre Pantoja, number Ooh. two. And with that, RC, who are you giving the award to? I'm going with Glover Teixeira, Jamal Hill. Mm. Now, I, I do believe Pantoja Moreno was a close second. What I loved about the Jamal Hill Glover Teixeira fight is I've never seen someone be as accurate and violent as Jamal Hill was in his striking in that fight and somebody be as dang tough as Glover Teixeira was. And there's always that, that video that you see of Jamal Hill getting the water poured over his head and the blood just dripping. That was a man's, man's fight to me. That was a great fight. I love that fight. I was there in Brazil. But for me, bro, I got to go Pantoja versus Moreno, too. Yeah. That fight had everything. And over and over, the flyweights deliver. You had the great champion in Brandon Moreno, who had just done away with Davis and Figueredo. He gets Pantoja. Pantoja goes after him from start to finish. And every time these two were close, it seemed like Pantoja was winning. But the moment Moreno got to space... He was the one doing the damage. And I'll never forget the post-fight interview. Knowing how this guy yes. was motivated to prove his father wrong. Dad, do you love me now? Dad, yeah. do you love me now? Talk about some heavy stuff from Alessandre Pantoja. All right, RC. It's time for our knockout of the year. First, your boy Izzy, Adesanya. My dog. Get to Miami, Florida, UFC 287. Starches Alex Pajeda and then shoots the arrows into his limp body. Max Holloway knocked out the Korean zombie in the zombies retirement Ooh. fight. Or late entry, late entry, Josh Emmett last week knocking out Bryce Mitchell. Listen, those other two moments are bigger moments, DC. But I have never seen somebody get hit and fall and do what Bryce Mitchell did. That overhand huh. right from Josh Emmett was absolutely starching. Bro, I'm sitting in the house with Jordan. Jordan was home this, this weekend, and Jordan says like 20 seconds before, he's like, Josh gonna knock dude out. And sure enough, 20 seconds later, bro, he hits him, and then I hear John Anik and Joe Rogan and you saying he's convulsing on the mat. That was bro. absolutely brutal, and he could not recover, DC. It was stunning, RC. And you know what, man? I had Max Holloway in the Korean Zombie, but I'm changing it to Emmett. And, and, dude, he hit him so hard, RC, that normally you, that reaction is from a kick. When somebody gets kicked right. in the head and it's perfectly timed kick, they go down like that. Nobody gets punched like that and has that reaction. And, RC, I'm so glad they cut the video there because he started convulsing, bro, and his feet were crossed. His body was shaking. The referee had to go and kind of touch him to slow him down and bring him back. It was an amazing knockout by Josh Emmett. All right, RC, submission of the year is the next of the DC and RC awards. First one, Alexa Grasso chokes out Valentina Shevchenko at UFC 283. Hey, Shavkat Rachmanov choked out Jeff Neal at UFC 285 with a standing rear naked choke. Or John Jones submitted Cyril Gaon at UFC 285 to become the heavyweight champion. Who's your award go to? I'm going with Alexa Grasso over Valentina Shevchenko. At this point, it seemed that Valentina Shevchenko was unbeatable. And Alexa Grasso was able to strike well enough that Valentina was trying to figure out other ways to win. And to know that she finished this fight with something she practiced in her training going up or leading up until the fight was one of the things that I love the most because it was about preparation and then preparation meeting opportunity, DC. And she capitalized yep. in that moment against one of the greatest women's fighters or mixed martial artists of all time. You know, for me, it's all about the moment, right? So I'll never forget the moment where Cyril Gunn is looking up at John Jones like he saw a ghost yeah. have to get choked out that quickly. <laughs> but for me, dude, it was crazy. Jones did an amazing job submitting him with a front choke. Mine, though, is Alexa Grasso still. Because as good as that moment was, and they're showing Jones and keep running it, but the visual of Valentina's face where the choke yes, was with the blood. being a completely yeah. different color 
from the rest of her entire body was nuts yeah. to me. Her jawline was completely white from the squeeze of Alexa Grasso. And it's all about the moment. But yes, watching Jones get that choke, the way Cyril Gunn looked at him looked like he had he was he was like, oh my God, I cannot believe that just happened to me. It was nuts. Bro, you know what was crazy? RC. You know what was crazy? Jordan, so Jordan is like a historian, right? <laughs> my son. He loves like you and John Jones because that was when I would make him sit down and watch these fights and made him love. When John Jones choked out Cyril Gunn, he just turned around to me and goes, what? 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 Because he was, because it was so much talk about like what John would be at heavyweight. And we all saw Cyril Gunn as this amazing talent. And it wasn't just him choking him out. It was the ease in which he did it. It was absolutely having no fear of your opponent after that sort of layoff, after that sort of weight gain, and it showed how John Jones truly is the GOAT. And I've been listening to you talk about him on the Joe Rogan experience, and it only puts him up there even more for me that he was able to accomplish something like this. You know, it, it just showed that Jones been dead lifting 800 pounds. All the videos of him lifting 800 pounds sure showed because he choked Cyril Gaon from a weird position. <laughs> All right, it's time for our male fighter of the year on our year in the awards. Number one, Ryan. Islam Mahachev, 2-0 versus Volkanovski this year, retaining his championship. Leon Edwards kept his welterweight title over Kamaru Usman and Kobe Covington. Or Tom Aspinall after becoming the UFC interim champion. RC, who gets your award? I went with Tom Aspinall. And that's probably the only reason Tom Aspinall is even in the top three. Bro, we have to remember what happens in his last fight of 2022. This man injured his knee. He's getting carted off, he's crying. And then to come back this year, I think it was who, uh, Tiberia, and then to fight Sergey Pavlovich, who to me, at the time of this fight, was one of the most feared humans in the entire world. He was on this great streak of knockouts and to see Tom Aspinall's athleticism, to see the way that he was able to use his power and overwhelm Sergey so early in this fight, it showed what sort of talent this dude is. And it made me think back to what you said Michael Bisping thought of him before this fight, that he was Muhammad Ali like. I'm not ready to say that, <laughs> but Tom Aspinall did shake up the world. Oh my God, my, Mike, I still, man, Mike was tripping. Mike still was tripping saying all that stuff in public. My male fighter of the year, it might not come as a surprise to you, but Islam Mahachev, if you beat the number one pound fighter in the world twice, bro, put, put your mic back on. Put your mic back on, man. Then you are the number one fighter in the world. Islam not only beat Volkanovski two times, the second time he knocked him out with a head kick. This guy is one of the best pound for pound, well, he's the number one pound for pound fighter in the world now after beating Volkanovski. So yeah, and rightfully so, RC. My male fighter of the year for 2023 is so the DC. great Dagestani warrior, Islam Mahachev. So DC, you get to be fighter of the year for beating a smaller guy twice. Not only beating a smaller bro, guy twice. Bro, you beat the number four. one pound for pound fighter of the world two times, bro. Number one. DC. And the best. You, DC. You, pick, you pick Volkanovski. DC, the first time the fight goes five rounds, it ends with Islam Mahachev underneath Alexander Volkanovski being dominated. The second fight, Volk took on like three days notice, and he was 748 pounds when he took the fight. The man had to cut 600 <laughs> pounds to fight against Islam Mahachev. And he got kicked in the head because he was short. And we're going to, you know what? What's the next What's RC, the next award? Dude? RC. RC, listen. RC, I understand Volk is a friend of the show. We all love him. But you're out here making excuses, man. It's like Jordan missed the tackle. And you're trying to find reasons why he missed the tackle. I all ain't right, never made no excuse for that. For, <laughs> it's time for our female fight of the year. RC, we got Alexa Grosso. 1-0-1 in 23, beat Valentina, had a draw with Valentina. Or Aaron Blanchfield, who was 2-0 this year and became a top contender. Or the GOAT, Amanda Nunes. While she only fought one time, she walked away as a double champion in the UFC. Who you got, RC? 
I got Amanda Nunes. Um, and it's not because of her volume of fights. It's because of what the women's division looks like now without her. She was truly that dominant. When you look at the weight classes she was able to dominate, it's like Erin Blanchfield and then a bunch of people who Amanda Nunes has beaten. And for her to walk away the way that she did, for her to lay it down after a, a dominant performance off of what we learned this weekend is an absolute oh dog God. in Irina Eldonia. That really shows <laughs> who and what Amanda Nunes truly is. Yeah, that was a great that was a great one. Amanda Nunes beating Irina Eldonia the way she did, nuts. Hey, so I picked Aaron Blanchfield, but I kind of want to change my pick. So I'm doing two. I'm going to pick Aaron Blanchfield and Zhang Wei Li. Because Zhang Wei Li actually defended her championship and landed more strikes you can't than anyone two. in the history of a title fight. So my pick is Aaron Blanchfield and Zhang Wei Li. This is what it is. I was uncertain. I was uncertain. I didn't know what to do. So Go to I the next award. What are more. we doing next, Jake? No, no, no. Car. No, you have something to say. All right, so here are some predictions we had early on in January, and let's see how we did. When will Conor return, DC, and who is he going to fight? Like, be honest. Like, here's I, think, I think he's going to fight Michael Chandler. I really do. I think he's going to fight Michael Chandler when he comes back. But I don't know when that's going to be, bro. I think in the summer. Yeah, I believe that's going to be the same fight that we see, and I think it's a fight we have to see. DC. Tap in or tap out, we see Nick Diaz in the octagon in 2023. I, I, I tap in, but here's the deal. I'm going to tell you this right now, Corporate Jake. Nobody better not send me no pictures of Nick Diaz looking all ripped and muscular. Because <laughs> last time in his training camp, he looked so ripped. But by the end of the, by the fight night, he looked a little more like what you expect from a guy that's in his late 30s that doesn't fight and train very often. I tap out. I just know we all age out at some point, and it will be difficult for me to see him back in the octagon in 2023. What are you laughing I'm at? I'm scared, brother. I'm so scared. Hey, three fights. <laughs> three fights that are must-see fights for the 2023 fighting schedule. What would they be for you? <laughs> RC, they can't use this against me, can they? I'm so <laughs> no, they scared right now. <laughs> okay, first one. I got to see. I got to see uh, John Jones fight Francis Ngannou. I have to. Brian, I know Zhang Wei Li just became the champ again, but I think that I have to see against Valentina Shevchenko. And my last fight, I got to see Chimaev against one of the top three. I need to see him versus either Edwards, Usman, or Cousin. So I want to see Chimaev in there with one of those guys. Those are the three fights I've got to see. I, I agree with Shevchenko, Wei Li. I believe that's a fight that we need to see, and we need to see it immediately. I picked Chandler and McGregor but just because the nature of what the fight can be, and I believe that brings out the best Connor. And the fight I really want to see is Chito Vera, Sean O'Malley. To see these two dudes match and have an opportunity to settle that score forever, I think that would be huge for me. Well, hey, I mean, hey, bro. I mean, bro. We are bad at our <laughs> jobs. We are terrible. Like, we are. I try to Whoa. tell people all the time, it ain't my dang job to predict <laughs> either, though, bro. Like, that ain't my job. My job is to watch the fight or watch the football game and tell y'all what I see and what I think. The freaking matchmakers over at UFC, they don't want to see us That's win, bad. DC. That's really what it is. They don't want to see us win. We're going to do better bad. at the that beginning of next year, though. That was bad, bro. We, I, can, I hate when better. we do that because then I know those videos coming back and it's going to just make us look like idiots because I'm telling you, dude, that was crazy. But I did get Chimaev versus Usman, but it was at 185. Asterisk. You got asterisk. O'Malley yeah, versus asterisk. Vera, but that's not until next, next year. year. Bro, we, I mean, we're terrible, dog. We're actually terrible. Hey, man, Jake, let's are we step stepping fly, fly now? Let's step fly, yeah, like, bro. Come on, man. <laughs> Listen, for our first step and fly, we are going to Kamaru Usman. And this is the man that is oozing mm. with style. Look at this fit for Usman Edwards Three. This was hard, DC. I, I had to even tell him myself. He may need like a little more neck for the turtleneck, but golly, that was clean. I mean, you went to London for that one. That was a, that was a good fight, big moment, 
And that was, I mean, honestly, it was cool, but like it was a little bit too much for me. I mean, you don't have to wear all that turtleneck and a pinstripe suit. Put a nice, put a nice suit on, a blue suit with a white shirt and a blue tie DC. or red tie, some some very DC. like norm, dre- like norm. Yes. DC. You dress like a politician from a Midwestern state. You can't tell people <laughs> what to wear. All right, <laughs> here we go. We got to go to the man, the myth, and the legend, Bruce Buffer. Bro, Bruce is clean every single week. But can somebody please ask him how many tuxedo sports coats this dude has, and does he ever repeat? Bruce Buffer be so Look fired at that. up, dog. When I got to be... When I got to be cage side to watch Bruce Buffer in London, the dude before the fight is kicking the cage. He's fired up. And he's doing all this <laughs> without breaking a sweat in a fire tuxedo jacket. Hey, RC, you probably was there for that Christmas one where if he turned to the left, it was yellow, it was red. If he turned to the right, it was green, it was shiny. I'm like, yeah, look at this guy right here, man. Hey, bro, you know what somebody told me? One of them dudes, uh, I don't know who it was. It was one of the fighters from London. They said, I made my UFC debut, and the only thing I remember was when Bruce Buff was introducing me, I saw his ring and thought to myself, wow, Bruce Buff must have a lot of money to have a ring like that. Doug <laughs> Bruce had on the biggest, most expensive ring in history. <laughs> this is crazy, man. Bruce Buffer got it going on, man. Corporate Jake. Let's see another. Hey man, and next up, next up, we have Algermain Sterling. Ooh. He came out, he was clean, and our very own Daniel Cormier said he was stepping fly. Yeah, Algermain Sterling, look at him, man. Dude looks like a champion. He's got the big gold necklace now. Before he had a fake one. This one's real. <laughs> he got the custom-made suit with the black shirt underneath. Let me tell you something. He is a champion, and that boy stepping fly right now. He walking into the octagon like he owns this place. Hey, he was clean. RC, he owned that. He was that. clean, DC. Yeah, he was clean. He also he owned that RC. Like the, the, the 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 chain was was perfect because it wasn't too much, but it wasn't too small to where it really didn't pop. I felt like Al Jermaine brought it brought it there, man. I thought that was dope. RC, he brought like he had like a fake necklace before one of them big ones, like Big Daddy Kane. And then he got a he got a real one once he started making all that championship money. And then his suit was all custom. Let me tell you when you know it's a good suit, RC. When you got the suit on and you ain't got a belt, but it still just fits your body perfectly. I mean, you ain't got no belt on, but it still just fits your body perfectly. Your, your pants don't move. Hey, you ain't got that's nothing. how your pants fit, huh, DC? Your pants Mm-mm. fit like that RC, under your belly, RC, right? My no? pants, RC. My pants be underneath my stomach. My pants be underneath my stomach, so it come right up against that little layer I got right there. But let me tell you somebody that do know how to dress a little bit. Let me do, let me do the best of RC because you know he padded LaBelle and he's so extra. But this number three, RC. Talk to me about this thing right here by you. It, it got two hey, patterns. Hey. Hey, that's that signature. That's that signature Andre Julius, man. Like one side, like the window pane, and then the other side is solid with the solid pants. You see, I got the Kamaro Uzman turtleneck sitting there in my living room, DC. That one was clean. Okay, I like that one. Good pick, DC. Yeah, that was clean, but that was a whole brown brown turtleneck. Look, number two right here. He, hey, I always tell y'all that he loved to talk about he was a Super Bowl champion. You know, you want to know who he won with? The Pittsburgh Steelers. Look at his shirt. The Ooh. same color of the Steelers. He might as well have a jersey Ooh. on. Ooh. DC, I rocked this for Halloween. I felt like I was walking back into the arena, baby. You see it? Pittsburgh Steelers, man. Like Wiz Khalifa said, man. Black and yellow, black and yellow, black and oh, yellow. Oh, oh, oh. Hey, here's number one. Number one, the suit is fire. But ladies and gentlemen, what he is holding is the thing he has told us 20 times that he has won over the course of 23. I've His never Emmy. said but that. But I mean, look, at, this is him in Yonk with that nice suit, but it's the Emmy that he has told us about time and time again. What a suit, RC. Hey, DC, this is this is a special suit. I, I got a purple suit. It was actually LSU Tiger logos all in the inside of it. I'm going to be honest. I didn't think I was going to win the award, so I was like, I'm going to win the fashion show. I wasn't even tripping. I was like, I know this. Ain't nobody going to go there and outdress me. It happened that we won them both, man. Like, that yeah. was 
that was fun. That was fun. It was it was cool cool to dress up. I was also way overdressed because they had a lot of people that were in there looking like they were going to a high school homecoming. RC, that was that purple rain right there. That was that purple rain. I was like, okay, RC. And then when you won, hey, well, I'll be honest with you, when you won, I was like, oh, yes. He going to legitimize our show even more. I was like, they might even run one of our reruns on actual ESPN. It's not just on ESPN, too. I was like, yo, we on now. <laughs> Well, DC, you know, the one thing we know about you, bro, is that you enjoy yeah, yeah, yeah. Fight Week. Let's take a look at some of the best of Daniel Cormier Fight Week's UFC. I took Jamal's money. It was brand new. He had all that new money. It smelled real fresh. I took it. <laughs> to the victor goes the spoil. Now, I want to feel you like as a middleweight. Oh, let me see. Uh Oh, 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 yeah, he drove. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh my God. Stop, you're gonna hurt yourself. Just like this one. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> my leg got him. My leg got him, dude. You tell him I want 25. It's not crazy. Okay, it's like, that's it. That's the move. Oh, oh, oh. 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 Dude, what did you do? Uh, <laughs> I heard it swing on my head. Oh. This is not wrestling. This is fighting. This guy, this is not wrestling. What? If you ever got me in a garlic ball situation, I would murder myself. I'm probably <laughs> 88 the other day. Nice. Ready for Ooh. it. No, I don't I'm know if you're ready. I am ready. Uh, Daniel! I f jumped in, man. I don't hey, big <laughs> hey, that was 325 down the middle right there. Hey. Throw it back. Work. Look at this. I mean, I'm going to three putt again. The three putt king. <laughs> Bro, why are you so bad at golf? And what, who, who picked out your outfit? What is wrong with your socks? No, why do you even play? You are wasting your time. You're going to be doing something no, that's, that's, that's so that's, much more fruitful for your life. And stop. stop letting these people please stop, please. kick you and pick you up during the fight week. You up. can't fight no more, Daniel. Hey, bro. Hey, RC, RC, I'm tired of people picking me up. I'm like, yo, I'm not Hasbula, bro. Stop picking me up. <laughs> hey, bro, is that weird also? Is that weird that everybody just kind of carries Hasbula? <laughs> He's an adult man. That's very weird. <laughs> I don't like it at all. But RC, like, RC, you saw what I told Justin Gaethje, throw it back. He threw the, he threw the golf ball, he pick it up and threw it back at me. Me and Justin Gaethje was at a golf course called Adios in Florida. They let you wear a t-shirt. We was cheating, man. We want all kind of money off these people over there. They, they let us just ride around and cheat. <laughs> man, it's time to tap in or tap out. Hey, you need to tap out on golf forever. Don't be like that, man. All right, guys, let's talk about some more awards. DC was the most shocking moment of 2023, Sean Strickland defeating Izzy. Absolutely. That was absolutely my most shocking moment because even Sean Strickland in the lead up to that fight had doubts and questions of whether or not he could get it done. He not only got it done, he did it in dominant fashion. Un it, look, unequivocally, yes, he is biggest upset. This dude running around Australia with a hat on like uh, Indiana Jones or, or Crocodile Dundee, and the people started cheering him. It was unbelievable. Yeah, uh, it's that's happened. It's the most shocking moment. Um, I never thought in a million years he'd win versus Israel Adesanya. I definitely didn't th think he'd outstrike him, which he did by a large margin. Now, what is not shocking is that he put hands on Drakus Duplessis this past weekend. <laughs> and what I love about it is the fact that Sean Strickland showed that he was a gentleman. He didn't want to run over the kids. He didn't want the kids in the way. So he told, what is it, was it Pantoja's kids? Or Gilbert, it was Pantoja's kids, right? 
or was it Burns That's Gilbert kids? Burns kids. He told Gilbert Burns kids. He told them, get out of the way. I don't want you to be a part of it. Now, let's throw these hands. And DC, does, honestly, does this make Sean Strickland more attractive to UFC fans? Um, you know what's crazy? It, it, you don't want to see that in the crowd, but people want to watch fights more when guys argue. Imagine how much more they want to fight this now that these two want to fight each other so bad that they do it inside the crowd at a UFC event. RC, we spoke about this earlier. There are people that want to be about that action and inside the octagon, and there are people that just want to fight yeah. you. Sean yeah. Strickland's one of those people that just want to fight you, so... I mean, I'm a little more interested in it. I I'm ready. I we got to stop seating these people right next to each other. And we got to stop putting these fighters in the same hotel. Because as we saw a couple weeks ago with Bobby Green and Armand yeah. Sarukin fighting each other the whole fight week. And now Sean Strickland and DDP. We got to be careful. Corporate Jake. Right, guys, this past year, we saw the highly touted Bo Nickel show up in the UFC and dominate. RC, tap in or tap out. Bo Nickel was the best newcomer of 2023. Yeah, I tap in on that. I tap in on the fact that Bo Nickel, and, I, and bear with me, Bo Nickel has almost a LeBron-type feel. He's a guy that has an extreme Ooh. high level of expectation, and at least in the fights he was given, he's shown you that he is everything he's been built or built to be, and Bo Nickel is going to be a problem going forward. Ooh, you're going to be in trouble for that one. You're going to be in trouble for that one. You said it. I can't believe you said it. Boy, you about to get it for that. He LeBron James now. So, Bo Nickel is LeBron James now. Oh, my God. Yes. Corporate Jake. I don't look, even know what to say to this Bo dude. Look at Bo Nickel before he became. Look at Bo Nickel before the UFC contract. He's the chosen one. You know it. I know it. Bo oh. Nickel was on here when he was still fighting on the contender, DC. Hush up. Oh, Answer the question. you're right. You're right. You actually right. Yes. You actually, while I he was know. on the show, he hadn't even made his debut, and then he was on the pay per view right away. Bo, Mick, Bo Nickel might be LeBron James. Yes, I do believe he's the best debut guy in RC. Wow, two fights, two pay per views, and on the DC and RC show. Huh? Interesting. Corporate J. I got yeah, yeah, Corporate last J. one. We know the UFC has a ton of great divisions with a ton of great champions, but DC. Tap in or tap out that the UFC's lightweight division ends 2023 as the best weight class. You know what's you know what's the worst thing about this whole question is earlier in the year I was saying it was the Bantam weights. I thought it was Bantam weight. I thought Bantam weight had finally passed lightweight, but no, it's lightweight again. I mean, because of how good Justin Gaethje looks and how good Armand Sarukian looks and how good Mateusz Gamrot looks, and then we still got Michael yep. Chandler and Charles Oliveira and Islam Mahachev. It's still lightweight, Sarukian. man. And it doesn't seem like it's not going to be lightweight for a long time. Yeah, I think I think the lightweight is not only the best class, it's the most exciting class. You know, you get some of those fights as well when you look at what you're getting from uh, the flyweight division, I think it is, if I'm right. Well, Weber Pantoja and um, Brandon Moreno. Uh, That's 125, fights, yep, 125. 125, yeah. But I think the lightweight division right now, when you look at not only the top, of this of this elite weight class but also one through ten fully there are all guys there it's a murderous row of contenders rc that is a great uh division also 125 but it's the lightweights right now this year has been one of the most amazing years in the ufc's history you always look at the calendar at the start of the year and you wonder can it deliver? We have had so many new champions. We have seen so many new stars break yeah. through. What do you think you're going to remember the most about the UFC in 2023? It's unpredictability. It was so many things mm -hmm. we thought we knew about the UFC. So many yep. things we thought we could predict about fighters and who they were and who they would be. And all of that's changed in such a short period of time. There were so many new champions in the UFC. So many times that belt changed waist, and I think we'll continue to see that going forward because it's so highly competitive now, and guys are so skilled and so talented. I think it was the unpredictability for me. I have a question for you, DC. Did you notice yep. anything special about the award we were giving out today?
the awards? Oh, we got the DC and RC awards. But oh, did you look at it? I didn't even realize that. No, I didn't even notice it was me kicking. I love that. I absolutely <laughs> love that. ESPN, as always. Hey, but RC, that's perfect technique, man. Left hand up and, and strong. I was looking strong. My goodness, look at that. I DC, mean, I you look had a very waist. lean. You look a little there, DC. <laughs> and I, I can confirm. I was a pound champion at that point. I can confirm you can still get your leg up there because when we were filming the opening to the show that week at uh, International Fight Week, you swung your leg kind of high and it scared the hell out of me. It let me know that I ain't hey, about that I, action. I, I am, I am not Sean Strickland. <laughs> I don't want it. Every I don't time want I to do fight. it, but every time I do it now, I fall down. I can't even stay up. Every time I try to kick somebody in the head, I fall on the ground. It's so embarrassing trying to spar. You know, my, my, RC, I agree with you on the unpredictability, man. You don't know. We thought we knew that Valentina was just the best. We thought we yep. knew that Leon Edwards has got, had gotten lucky. Kamara was going to get him. We thought we knew. So we thought we knew Aljo was the guy. But it didn't happen. We thought Paul Tan was done after Izzy beat him. And he becomes the 205-pound champion. It was an amazing year for the UFC. I love this company, man. I love the job I have. I love being able to watch the fights, the people I work with. It has been an amazing 2023. And I'm glad that we get to do this every single week because in all of that, our show has grown even more. So, yeah, guys, man. as I pass it to Ryan to sign off for the last time this year, I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, we thank you. We love and appreciate you for yeah. your support. And we will always, always appreciate you guys tapping into what we're doing. Hey, absolutely, man. From myself as well, we just want to say thank you. We appreciate you guys sticking with us, allowing us to grow together, allowing me to grow in this sport. And remember, you can get us wherever you get your podcast on Tuesdays. We're also on YouTube. And you can also check us out at midnight on ESPN2. We'll see y'all next year. Thanks for rocking with us for 2023. What's up, guys? Welcome to a brand new episode of DC. I'm Daniel Cormier. That's my guy, Ryan Clark. It's DC and RC. RC, as washed up as I am, I fought more recently than John Jones. <laughs> hey, you know me. I'm barbecue sauce, dog. <laughs> well, Charles got the better back. Like, look at Cheeto's back. Cheeto back look like a, Cheeto back look like an old ass <laughs> man back. Like his back kind of small. Like, why Cheeto back looks so small? <laughs> Georgia. Uh, and why are you always worried about food? This man <laughs> finna defend his title for the first time, and you ask him about eating? <laughs> we are now joined by my best friend <laughs> in the entire He's world. DC eating something. DC, what the hell are you eating, DC? You working. You working, DC. DC eating something. What? <laughs> <laughs> Hey, look, another guy that's fighting this weekend. Look at this guy. There he is. Sit down on my lap. <laughs> Durizio. This guy. Durizio. Now, what is Russell Westbrook? I mean, she, she I'm sorry. What uh, is Gilbert don't, Burns? Don't, don't do that. Don't what do is that. Gilbert Burns don't do that. Gonna do don't do that. What? What? <laughs> Dog. Which, bro, neck. you ain't got no neck. no neck. <laughs> yeah. Like, how do, you, <laughs> how do you rear naked choke a person with zero esophagus? This is DC. I am RC. I want you to meet my son, JC Jordan Clark. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, guys, got it as 12 bonus. 12 bonuses in 12 Your UFC ADC. appearance. You got me sitting in my pants. I'm squirming. It's like it's like <laughs> I'm a woman at Magic Mike, double XL. I'm dancing, sitting in my chair. I can't sit still. Your MMA knowledge compared to last few times. <laughs> I mean, do, we, do you even need DC at this point? It's like a new guy comes to class and he like sits right next to the teacher. Ah, Is it just MC ah, now? Ah. Is it just MC? I mean, what did he do? He just canceled the show like it's And he wants to prove how good he is. Now, well, I did agree. Sent me, sent me his day. <laughs> Jake, oh. he, Jake, he can't wait win. Wait a minute, wait he a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> he does in other movies. <laughs> the best RC. one he got, though. RC, that's not fly? No. That, Come that's on. not it, one, RC. The other ones were Come cool. on. I'm with you on all the other ones. Okay. This one you tried too hard. Oh, but I tell you one thing, I was like, uh, on that body's I think he's pretty funny, but damn, you were laughing pretty hard and some of these terrible guys. <laughs> that <laughs> that hilarious, bro. You know what, I, I, I think, mm -hmm. I think Islam should fight Connor. I think Islam should fight Connor. Guys. 
every Tuesday, me and Ryan Clark are on our ESPN YouTube channel where we get your podcast. And at 12 midnight on ESPN2 for Ryan Clark, Jordan Clark, and Kamara Usman. I'm Daniel Corey. Thank you so much. You guys joining us. Appreciate Thank you for joining us for DC and RC.